As we begin our takeoff from the Los Alamos airport, we will be heading west, flying over the town of Los Alamos. Very quickly, you will see a yellow line crossing the landscape on the west end of town. This line represents one of the most active faults in New Mexico, the Pajarito Fault. Hundreds, if not thousands, of earthquakes on this fault over the past million years have downdropped the Pajarito Plateau on the east side of the fault by at least 200 feet. After crossing the fault, we will briefly fly over Frijoles Canyon, the main canyon running through Bandelier National Monument. Turning northwards, the southeast rim of the Valles Caldera comes into view, along with Redondo Peak, the caldera's resurgent dome. As we fly over the rim, we will be directly over Highway 4 again, descending into Valle Grande, the largest valley inside the Valles Caldera. Now, before discussing the geology of the Valles Caldera, let's take one more flight on Google Air, starting at a high perspective south of the Jemez Mountains. Of course, the blue circle outlines the Valles Caldera. The older Toledo Caldera had a nearly identical location and boundary. The goal of this flight is to display how topography dictated the distribution of pyroclastic flows for both the Toledo and Valles Caldera eruptions. In the big picture, pyroclastic flows behave like a fluid, so low topographic zones around the caldera were the chosen routes for these pyroclastic flows. And because the topography in the Jemez Mountains was basically the same for both caldera eruptions, the distribution of their pyroclastic flows is also similar. As we approach the Valles Caldera from the south, an overlay of the Bandelier Tuft distribution will drape over the topography. The light orange color represents the upper bandolier tuff and the dark orange color represents the lower bandolier tuff. Notice that neither tuff is present in the topographically high southern Jemez Mountains. Extensive plateaus of tuff, however, are in place on either side. As we fly over the Valles Caldera, the topographically high La Grulla Plateau also block pyroclastic flows, though lower elevations on the east side provided a pyroclastic flow corridor heading to the north. As we turn to the east, volcanic highlands of the northeast Jemez Mountains, including Cerro Pelon, Polvadera Peak, and Chicoma Peak come into view. These Chicoma volcanic highlands block pyroclastic flows to the northeast. Heading back south, however, the extensive tough cap Pajarito Plateau is clear. As we continue turning to the southwest, we will again see the southern Jemez Highlands nearly devoid of bandolier tuff. Finally, we will pull back, climb in elevation, providing a full view of the Valles Caldera but looking towards the west. This view and the accompanying map showing the distribution of bandolier tuff highlights how the topographically high southern Jemez Mountains, the La Grulla Plateau, and the Chicoma Highlands were successful in blocking outward pouring pyroclastic flows. Okay, welcome to the magnificent Valles Caldera National Preserve. From our last stop, we've climbed up over the rim of the Valles Caldera and dropped down. So we're looking out into the Valle Grande. It's just a small part of the Valles Caldera. And this national preserve first happened in the year 2000. So it's been in the national park system for 20 years now. And it really is kind of New Mexico's Yellowstone. We have this beautiful caldera and it's got lots and lots of these uh, valleys with small mountains inside the caldera. Beautiful, two beautiful streams, the east fork of the Jemez River in the southern part of the caldera, and the uh, San Antonio Creek in the northern part of the caldera. If we take a look at this satellite map of the Jemez Mountains here, here's the Rio Grande, the town of Española, uh, here's the Abiquiu Reservoir in the Rio Chama, Abiquiu up here. So here you have the Jemez Mountains north to south, and right smack dab in the middle, we have the circular feature of the Valles Caldera. 
So we've come over the rim from the town of Los Alamos. We've come over the rim uh, down into the caldera. So this valley right here is Valle Grande. And that's this beautiful valley we have out in front of us. And behind me, over my head, there's a large mountain inside the caldera. And that's Redondo. That's Redondo Mountain. And it's the only mountain inside the caldera that's not an actual volcano. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But inside the caldera, there are several small mountains, and these are all volcanoes that have come up inside the caldera after the caldera formed. So first, I want to point out this is the groundbreaking geologic map. Uh, three geologists, their last names being Smith, Bailey, and Ross, they started working in the Jemez Mountains in the late 1940s. Throughout the 50s and the 60s, did field work, and they published many papers and this geologic map in the late 1960s and the first 1970, 1971, most of their publications. But it was truly a groundbreaking uh, series of publications that these three geologists did because prior to their publications, no one had truly described how these large calderas form. So the Valles Caldera is famous in the world of volcanology. It's the world's type example of what they classified as a resurgent caldera. And so this is the geologic map Smith, Bailey, and Ross published. You can see I've used it for many years. It's in poor shape. Uh, this map is no longer available in print, but you can download it for free from the US Geological Survey website. Uh, but you can see basically this is the caldera and all the yellow colors in here these are going to be the volcanoes the the volcanoes that are younger than the caldera that came up inside the caldera the big mountain behind my head uh, in the middle of the caldera that is what smith bailey and ross classified as a resurgent dome in the middle of the caldera now the Valles caldera produced pyroclastic flows that they coined as the upper bandolier tuff. So this light orange color you see outside the caldera to the, to the east, to the west, to the southwest, a few corridors to the north, uh, those represent the upper bandolier tuff. These are pyroclastic flows that came out during the formation of the Valles caldera. Now the that eruption, which occurred 1.25 million years ago, was preceded by an older caldera we talked about, the Toledo caldera, at 1.6 million years ago. And the Toledo caldera was essentially in the same place as the Valles, although it had a, a extension to the northeast here that we refer to as the Toledo embayment. So, that eruption, 1.6 million years, produced pyroclastic flows, which are the dark orange color on this geologic map. So even though both eruptions emitted roughly the equivalent volumes, or over 300 cubic kilometers of magma, uh, obviously we see a lot more of the younger upper bandolier tuff than the lower bandolier tuff on the map because it's buried. The older bandolier tuff is buried by the younger bandolier tuff, upper bandolier tuff. So what I'd like to do is just point out uh, the simple story that Smith, Bailey, and Ross came up with for the formation of the Valles Caldera. So with their model, they believe that on one day, 1.25 million years ago, a large volume silica-rich magma chamber had formed in the central and probably after an earthquake event triggered the eruption, we had a single eruption column 
that started the eruption event. And this eruption column was incredibly vigorous, going up at least 25 kilometers into the stratosphere uh, and probably higher. And so very powerful eruption column. And this phase of the eruption was going to go on for hours. And all that mag was disseminating in the stratosphere and started to cool, solidify, and rain back down on the landscape, uh, creating a tephra deposit. That particular tephra we call the Sankawi tephra. And as it rained down, blanketing the Jemez Mountains in ash, pumice, and crystals, uh, we know it was a pretty calm day. The wind was blowing slightly to the northeast, uh, transporting the finer particles in that direction, but it wasn't the real windy day like the older caldera, the Toledo caldera, that we looked at in the, in the second stop. Anyway, after many hours of this phase of the eruption, multiple vents began to connect to the magma chamber. So instead of having one single vent that was going 30 kilometers high, you have multiple vents with so much magma being ejected, the density of all the magma particles would cause those columns to continually collapse. And as they hit the ground, started to flow outward as these pyrocles so this is the real catastrophic phase of the eruption. It may have gone on for a couple of days with pyroclastic flows going in all directions, 10, 15 miles off to the east, off to the southwest, a few corridors to the north. And as that eruption continues, you continue to vacate the magma. And so you get less and less magma and eventually, the roof, solid rock that's above the magma chamber, at some point will no longer be stable. You'll have ejected so much of the magma that this roof crust above the magma chamber will catastrophically collapse. So this is the actual caldera formation here. And we know from geophysical data that the east side of the caldera collapsed profoundly on the order of 4,000 to 5,000 feet, whereas the west side of the caldera collapsed less, more like 1,000 feet to uh, 2,000 feet. So, so we have this huge hole forming that's thousands of feet deep. And the eruption still continues, but most of the pyroclastic flows, instead of going outward, away from the caldera area, actually were filling in this massive hole that had formed. So we find the thickest part of the upper bandelier tuff actually inside the Valles caldera, much thicker than it is outside of the Valles caldera. So finally the eruption's over. The eruption's over, we have this massive hole, we have a couple thousand pyroclastic flow filled in the caldera, and it probably took hundreds of years for that pyroclastic flow inside the caldera to actually turn into rock, cool and solidify. So what we've learned in the last uh, couple of decades, especially by geologists like Fraser Goff out of Los Alamos, is that inside the caldera, within about 50 the floor of the caldera domed upwards to form what Smith, Bailey, and Ross classified as a resurgent dome in the middle of the caldera. So I think the best way to visualize or understand what the resurgent dome represents is this caldera collapse is so profound. The crust, as it collapses downward, into the lower parts of the magma chamber and soft mushy rock that's pushed outward away. Well, over the next 40 to 50,000 years, that mushy rock kind of comes back in. Residual and new magma comes in as well. And it causes that collapsed caldera to actually, in a sense, 
compound up and form this structural dome inside the caldera, and that is what what Redondo Peak is above my head. So that is the caldera's resurgent dome. We see resurgent domes in many big calderas all around the planet, so they're very common features. Lastly, the last phase of volcanism that's going to be occur occurring inside the caldera, Smith, Bailey, and Ross classified as ring fracture volcanic activity. So in the broken area of rock that defines the caldera collapse, uh, new magma, residual magma, is able to come up through those broken rock areas and erupt these small volcanoes. So if we pan across the Valle Grande to that first mountain across, that is one of these ring fracture volcanoes called Cerro del Medio that's got a lot of the fire burn scar from the 2011 Las Conchas fire burn. So that's going to be one of these ring fracture volcanoes that's come up inside the caldera. Essentially, we've had eight pretty major volcanoes come up inside the, since the caldera formed. So from this point, we're going to drive, continue driving across to the west, across the southern part of the caldera, and eventually head to the western rim of the caldera and get a fantastic view looking into the caldera of the resurgent dome of some of these ring fracture volcanoes from the west rim perspective.